Good afternoon, and welcome back to um, a Description Across Disciplines. My name is Maggie Chow. I am a fellow at the Society of Fellows and a lecturer in art history. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce very briefly, since we are starting a little late, the two speakers of this panel who will be um, talking to us on about what I think is the, a prob the problematic status of description in two very different disciplines, psychology and music. So um, our first speaker is Jill Murawski, a professor of psychology at Wesleyan University. And her talk, uh, you'll be getting a handout for her talk. Um, her work in social psychology deals with gender, the psychology of women, the psychological dimensions of reproductive technologies, and the history of psychology. Her paper today is entitled Giving Away, in brackets, Description in the Psychological Sciences. Our second speaker is Marianne Smart, the Gladys Arada Terrell Professor of Music at the University of California, Berkeley. Her work focuses on the social dimensions of 19th century opera, and she's worked on or is working on um, links between music and gesture and performance and the centrality of opera in networks of activism in Italian politics. Her talk today, though, will focus on um, the topic of description in music after new historicism. So um, I welcome you to uh, this afternoon's panel. And Jill. I'm going to see if I'm tall enough. Are you tall enough there? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to preface that this thing, I, I must have made a, an error in, in my in the bio, uh, and I apologize in terms of description, and, and it describes a uh, kind of career tra trajectory rather than the content of my work. And let me just sort of give a quick background in that I was trained um, in the um, at the at the terminus of the heyday of behaviorism. So my training in psychology was as a strict scientific observational stance and in uh, dance, where I also trained in lab annotation, which is a similarly kind of behavioral literalness of, of description. Um, and and uh, I since uh, went over to the dark side. So this, I'm um, going to tell you a little bit about, about that. Um, one morning, uh, and also I took very uh, directly the instructions to do discipline, you know, uh, description across the discipline. So much of my talk is about how psychologists take um, description, but also how science studies and historians of science take description. Um, one morning last year, a student of mine walked to prepare for the GREs, walked into the antechamber, and saw a female stance like this in, uh, in the restroom, um, uh, not in the restroom, in the rest area. Um, and it, it, um, turned to her, and she noticed he was noticing her, and said um, that from a TED talk, she had learned that such a stance was a power pose, that if held for two minutes, either like this, like this, um, would enhance her performance on the test. In fact, it would enhance her performance on nearly anything she undertook. TED Talk speaker, the social psychologist Amy Cuddy, announced that psychological research demonstrated the success of power posing. Two minutes of posing, or fake it till you make it, works because the physical act of looking powerful changes actual physiological conditions, namely the production of deer testosterone, and cortisol, which in turn improves performance. Cuddy's globally circulated, over 24 million viewers have seen the TED Talk, much publicized TED Talk, seems exemplary of the now iconic slogan, iconic in psychology, of giving psychology away. That expression was coined by George Miller, one of the founders of cognitive psychology, whose 1969 American Psychological Society Association's presidential address urged psychologists to give psychology away, and I quote Miller, as a means of promoting human welfare, end quote. Though interwoven with critiques both of behaviorism and of professionalism in psychology, um, Miller's address proclaimed that a coming revolution in our conception of human nature and a concomitant responsibility to give that new conception away was at the forefront of psychology, should be at the forefront of psychologists' concerns. For him, this gifting should not take the form of applied science or technology. Rather, and I quote Miller, the people at large will have to be their own psychologists and make their own application of the principles that we establish, 
Cuddy's TED Talk and Miller's allied proposal for giving away psychology signals one kind of working of description in psychology, of thin description. In an insightful essay on thick and thin description in the sciences, Ted Porter, historian of science Ted Porter, notices how what is given away, thin description, and I quote Porter, offers outsiders opportunity to act and choose, relying on knowledge without deep understanding, end quote. As Miller recognized the project, giving away psychology means enabling people to be their own psychologists. Yet there is an additional virtue of thin description in science besides that of public understandings or usefulness. Thinness also transmits the sense that science is transparent and that it provides neutral data, not expert claims. Thin description, standardized, uniform, quantified, statistical knowledge, rides fast on the general perception that is derived through scientists' objectivity, detachment, independence, and disinterestedness, not their expert judgment. It conveys, in other words, it conveys a truth effect. A faith in thinness, Porter writes, relieves scientists of responsibility by implying that they are not engaged in subtle interpretation, but acting on evidence. A seeming transparency is often mobilized to discourage skeptics from peering into those boxes that, in truth, are mystifyingly black because based on arcane practices and hidden assumptions. Yet science also entails that, uh, what we can call th a thick description, most obviously in the increasingly complex understandings of the world and objects in that world. Thick description adheres in technically sophisticated instruments and methods, in the local specificities of knowledge making, and in contestations over the meaning of data. Thick description might rely on positive precepts, precepts, but it claims of maintaining a stringent objectivity. However, its complexities include uncertainty, alternative explanations, controversy, and suspiciousness about the reliability of data. Thus, science's descriptions of the world realize ideals of both thin and thick description, of thinness and thickness. For instance, turning back to uh, Amy Cuddy's TED Talk, tracing the fast traveling thin descriptions of the power pose back to the elaborate science of its origins, and I did that explicitly, I went to her website and followed it. One finds uncertainty, proxy objects, disparate interpretations, and a near cascade of inferences. For instance, I'll give you a few. Animal studies are generalized to human action. Cortisol levels are translated as stress, and then stress is translated as diminished potential to perform. Testosterone, measured in its minute quantities, is yet esteemed for its magnificent powers. <laughs> Short duration actions are made equivalent to long duration aspirations. Race, gender, and class are obscured in experimental designs, and so on. Thin and thick descriptions, using terms adopted by Clifford Gertz and Gilbert Riles, pose particular matters of concern for science study scholars. These scholars investigate the dense practices of science and science making, and yet they also, these scholars, need to attend to the uh, thin descriptions, especially as scientific truth claims make their way into culture, changing our conceptions and our practices. Using the case of school testing, um, Porter has shown this. He illustrates how thin description not only conceals scientists' local skills, their expert judgments and uncertainty, but also obscures the ways that precise quantitative indicators of school performance eventually shape the practices of teaching, the experiences of learning. He observed how the thinness of the testing regime has the, and I quote Porter again, the capacity to thin out programs of instruction and learning, to drink up the sea. It is the drinking up of the capacity of surface descriptions in psychology that I want to explore further. But I'll do so first by talking a little bit more about thin and thick description in the psychological sciences. First and tellingly, description is a rarely used term in psychology. With one historical exception, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, the thin and thick kinds of descriptions just discussed are distinctions usually made by observers standing outside psychology, not psychologists themselves. 
Research psychologists as self-understood as self -understood scientists observe and report. Objectivity and value neutrality are governors on their observations of psychological phenomena. Contemporary psychology researchers do occasionally use the term description, yet it's used in a very specific case to refer to data that makes no, that in which they're making no claims of underlying causal processes. For instance, you can use descriptive statistics to give numeric representation, say, to the distribution of test scores of second graders in Ohio, or the average age of onset of schizophrenia. The role of this objective neutral observer in psychology, with few exceptions, was undisturbed and unchanged by the epistemic troubles that beset the humanities and other social sciences in the 1960s. Psychologists continued to observe, count, measure, and calculate, and then go back and check all of these, the practices that have been referred to by some as a method fetishism. Likewise, the myriad concerns about language introduced by deconstruction with deconstruction and post-structuralism lit no detectable fires in psychology. Researchers' use of observational language continued to deploy terms that would trouble, seriously trouble, many literary theorists. Take, for instance, the fact that they did use and still use binary categories of introversion, extroversion, male, female, nature, nurture, rational, irrational, agency determinism, dominance submission, and mind-body. Psychology's long-standing commitment to objective observation accords decently well with the science stance emerging in recent movements in literary studies towards surface reading, and I'm indebted to Sharon Marcus's and Stephen Best's report. These studies, according to them, and I quote, seem to be relatively neutral about their objects of study in which they tend less to evaluate than to describe and in which they situate in landscapes neither utopian nor dystopian." End quote. However, there was a time when psychologists did conscientiously identify description in their science in ways that closely resemble the distinctions now being discussed in literary studies. Heather Love borrows from Riles and, and Geertz, who those psychologists also borrowed from in, 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 the, in the 60s, to distinguish between, and I quote Love, unadorned first order accounts of behavior that can be recorded just as well by a camera as a human agent, end quote. That's thin description. And accounts that add, and I quote, I love again, many layers of human significance, including attributions of intention, emotion, cognition, and depth, which she refers to as thick description. In the 1960s, psychologists themselves took up, took up Riles and Gertz kinds of distinctions between kinds of description. Thus, in Miller's APA address, um, he identified behaviorism with thin description that registers only the surface, the action, the eye blink. Behaviorists, he argued, either eschew or deny anything deeper, any complexity of meaning or thought. For Miller and the legion of cognitive psychologists in the making, behavior's commitment to observing and describing only visible behavior failed to fully register reality. And, more importantly, it was premised on a faulty understanding of human nature as mechanical, as automatic. Miller fixed not um, um, on the effects of behaviorism, the effects of what he deemed, and I quote, I use his term, a conception of human nature that assumes living organisms are nothing but machines, end quote. Most worrisome was the principle that behavior not only can be predicted, but also changed by controlling environmental conditions. Giving this behavioral thin description psychology away, Miller contended, risks the eventual control of behavior by powerful, and I quote him, not my term, industrial or bureaucratic elites. For the laity, this mechanical conception of future nature, human nature, could easily become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whereas behaviorism came to stand for thin description and precarious description for Miller, as it did for Geertz, Cognitive psychology promised to record the richness and complexity of human nature. This peaceful revolution, as Miller called it, would substitute behaviorism's prediction and control with a science of understanding and prediction. A cognitive revolution promised to replace behaviorism's mechanical man with a view of human nature as self-conscious, motivated, and thinking. Notably, it understood humans to be self-reflexive, 
and self-directed for the emerging cognitive world build also acknowledged habeas mentum, the right of man to his own mind. These root conceptions were of utmost significance because, as, as Miller would go on to write, that imagination, ingenuity, and creativity are widely distributed but underutilized in, 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 among hum, in human life. This scientific revolution, probably successful beyond it, what many of its uh, progenitors deemed, generated not then not just a new theory, but a new scientific object. And this new ontology was of a complex, flexible, creative, rational, and self-reflexive object. It demanded thick description. Thus, I've given you two different viewpoints for understanding thin and thick description, one from the outside, how historians and science study scholars might understand the thin and the thickness of doing science, or of science, including psychology, and the other of the insiders, their marking of a certain kind of descriptive practice as either thin or thick, and the consequences, the implications for, for the object of inquiry. And I want to draw upon them, so this is my talk, um, to look um, at using both of these kind of templates of thin and thick to look at uh, Milgram's study, uh, Stanley Milgram's uh, famous studies of obedience conducted in the early 1960s. Um, and what, um, what we did as science scholars and as psychologists was to re-enter the archives of Stanley Milgram's work. Um, those archives are rich, um, complex, thick, um, and, and um, remaindered in there is much of what uh, Milgram observed um, and reported um, only partially. The multiple experiments of Milgram's, um, there were 24 uh, experiments in his program, although only one was published in a scientific uh, form, involved a laboratory scene. I'm, I'm assuming most of you know of Stanley Milgram's famous obedience experiments where he um, created a, a scene in which people thought they were shocking a learner if the learner got the questions wrong. These uh, multiple experiments involved a laboratory scene elaborately staged to look like a learning experiment where subjects were assigned the role of teachers and instructed to administer increasingly painful shocks to learners and who was actually an accomplice of the experimenter under the ex uh, supervision of an experimenter. The first published account of these studies reported, and I quote, of the 40 subjects, 26 obeyed the orders of the experimenter to the end, proceeding to punish the victim until they reached the most potent shock available on the shock generator. I had some regret today. We've seen so many beautiful objects <laughs> under description, and I'm going to be talking about disobedience and obedience and, and violence, actually. The experiment um, yielded a surprising finding at the sheer strength, uh, Milgram wrote, of obedient tendencies. And I quote Milgram, subjects have learned from childhood that it is a fundamental breach of moral conduct to hurt another person against his will. Yet 26 subjects abandoned this tenet in following the instructions of the, an authority who has no special powers to enforce his commands. End quote. Milgram reported with surprise as well the extraordinary tension um, generated by the procedures, generated in the subjects. Even, and as he quote, the initially poised businessman, and he was very uh, preoccupied with status, um, exhibited stuttering, twitching, and near nervous collapse. If the electrician did that, he would be less concerned, but that's another whole story. In the preface to the scientific report, Milgram stepped beyond empirical evidence to pronounce that obedience, quote, is the psychological mechanism that links individual action to political purpose. And I'm going to go back to this political ontological premise later. In fact, the very first paragraph claims that the massive scale in humanities of the Holocaust occurred only because a very large number of persons obeyed orders. The behavioral studies of obedience have traveled far. The findings are regularly used to explain mundane acts of obedience and horrendous atrocities from the Holocaust to Abu Ghraib. It's recently used in, in trials of, um, of financial, in, in people in financial fiascos to explain their um, violating um, the law. Um, and it is deemed among the uh, most important 
um, if not the most significant psychological experiment in 20th century psychology. It has undergone multiple replications, even one sponsored by a major television network. Textbooks, articles rehearse the importance of this, and um, it, had, um, it, 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 it goes unquestioned in, in nearly any of these venues. Um, and ignored in most of these replications and reports uh, is, sub is the subject's accounts, the methodological critiques that have been rendered, and the alternative explanations. The initial scientific publication and subsequent writings accord with thin description in both senses of I I've outlawed above. It is close but not deep, it's behavioral, not cognitive, observational, not inferential, reliable quantification, not suspicious interpretation. The obedience experiments used a strict behavioral measure, that is that he operationalized obedience as pressing the lever, and disobedience as not pressing the lever or ceasing to press the lever. And he talked about this binary quality of this behavior. They, um, the archives contain just, just um, plentiful evidence that Milgram and his team observed meticulously and closely and recorded an array of subjects' behaviors other than the operationalized obedience or, debe obedience or disobedience. They show the research term to have intensely preoccupied, be it, excuse me, they show the research team to have been intensely occupied with an array of events, actions, and talks. So he was careful in his data. Um, and he went on, and I, I don't know what, how much time I've used, do you know? Hmm. Uh, we started when, at 1.30. Huh? We, we started a little late, at 1.35 or something. Okay. So I have, uh, I, I've done it for the purpose. He, I, I want just, I'll have to describe it. He did three strategies to deal with all this extraneous variable werewolves. One, he took the tensions um, and suggested the tensions were attempts to make people obey. That is, that there were internal strains that kept us from, um, from disobeying. Um, second, he took an array of behaviors, twitches, talk, complaints, resistances, dissent, and termed them and, and reinterpreted them in psychoanalytic terms. They were defense mechanisms, denials, and dissociations. Um, and thirdly, he acknowledged that some of these behaviors might be resistance and dissent, so he created a new term of dissent, which he said falls short of being disobedience. So in other words, he corralled all these other behaviors and actions and talk and twitches, gestures um, that the subjects were, were displaying um, and discounted them as failed obedience. I mean, failed disobedience, excuse me. We went back, and I'm going to be quick, we went back to the archives. And what we did is we bracketed some assumptions. Um, I'm going to quick on that. We bracketed the pre-investigative uh, assumptions. What if we considered, we asked, the institutional norms of experimental practice, not as setting a neutral scene for action, but instead as partially constitutive of subject's performance? Accordingly, what if we bracket the canonical uh, tenets of agency and autonomy and that equates obedience with loss of agency and disobedience with, with supreme agency? With a different set of premises, Ethan Hoffman, um, Nick Meyerberg, and I analyzed these archival materials. We waived the ontological assumptions that agency must be wholly sovereign and autonomous, that a person's efficacy always reflects her conscious determination, and that the attentions of performances ultimately are intelligible. In so doing, we were able to detect and catalog a vast way in that subject, ways that subjects resisted command for obedience. And I think here, what I'm talking about it ties a little bit, but indirectly to the last two talks we heard. The various ways they acted otherwise, their behavior, talk, twitters, titches, twitches, and whatever. Thus, our empirical investigation adopts a political economy that appreciates resistances as constrained, in this case, by experimental situations, as sometimes non-efficacious, and as including not just intentional acts, but possibilities at the cusp of identifiable performance. It warrants asking then, what might be the effects of giving away psychological knowledge 
that not only describes obedient behavior, but also describes the myriad ways of acting otherwise. What might ensue from taking up the ontology of non-sovereign agency to identify the unmarked potentials for resisting authority? The meta project of giving psychology away, as psychology urged and many psychologists have heeded, whether it be brain-based explanations of depression or the powers of power, entails giving psychological scripts that pronounce certain performances and self-knowledge while obscuring other performances and self-knowledge. From Milgram's truly behavioral experiments, we learn about the power of acting obediently and the very likely failure of trying to dissent, be dissent, to dis, uh, failure of dissenting acts. With these lessons, we need to consider how such thin descriptions of psychology extracted through laborious technical operations and from the grounds of particular ontological worldviews might not merely give psychology away, they also might be giving away psychology. Such descriptions, in other words, might be giving away ontological possibilities for humans to act otherwise. One of the reasons um, I'm so pleased to be part of this conference is that the status of description in my field has changed quite dramatically in recent years. And I'm going to begin by sketching a little bit how I see that change to have taken shape, and then in the second half of the paper, um, trying to perform or sketch in the time that I have more like a sketch, um, uh, an example of a, a new kind of description or a blend of, um, of description that I think isn't being done very much. So one way of measuring this recent shift is, but might be by way of the explanations that I've relied on to translate the rather obscure term musicology into everyday practice. If you are a musicologist, you always have to translate. Um, and for years, it worked quite well for me to explain that musicologists were a lot like English professors. But the main difference uh, was simply that the texts we studied were symphonies and operas rather than novels and poems. For the past decade or so, musicology has inched away from the practices of literary criticism and come closer to history. And one of the main objectives of musicological writing is now often to construct a history of listening or to give an account of how specific historical audiences used, understood, and reacted to music. Energy is now directed not at describing musical works, but at describing the critical discourses of past audiences, or the mechanics of an experimental and often obsolete musical instrument, or the sight lines, ticket prices, and even the cooling systems of a particular opera house. Attention has shifted away from deciphering the communications about history, subjectivity, or power that might be encoded in works and towards musical activities performed by human agents, people doing things with music or musical performances making people do things. I could almost stop there <laughs> with that pithy assessment of the concerns of the field. But as I set to work on this paper, Knowing that I would be the only envoy from music studies on the program, I became acutely conscious of my own position in this evolution, and I began to mistrust my sense of how the field looks now and how it may have changed. So I'm going to begin or, or continue instead with some quick samples to ground the view that I've just outlined uh, before moving on to contemplate the ethical impulses behind this shift and then in the paper's second half, as I've said, I'll experiment with an approach that might move music back closer to the center of our disciplinary practices. Um, so the next little bit is, is going to go very quickly through a few examples from recent writing um, with a lot of text on slides, which I'm not going to read. Um, so you may get dizzy, but it's, um, it's only three slides. So, among the ways uh, one could take the, me the measure of an entire discipline in five or 10 minutes, uh, one of the most revealing might be with a series of, what, of core samples, a comparison of representative passages excised at regular intervals of time. So in this spirit, I've pulled what I think are representative excerpts um, at rigid 10-year intervals from the leading journal in English-speaking musicology, the Journal of the American Musicological Society. That journal, known as JAMS, has a very low acceptance rate. 
and is known for eliciting detailed and often fierce, even cruel, peer reviews, um, which means both that the quality of articles is, is very strong and that the approaches it represents skew towards the conservative, probably. Um, so, and among the available options in each year, I've chosen articles and authors that are stronger than the average and on the young side, things that have had real influence in the field. So I hope this is a fair slice of the discipline. Here's one from 20 years ago. Writing in 1995 about songs by the gay composer Mark Blitzstein, David Metzer identified an opposition between public and private realms in Whitman's poems, then found musical analogs.